All right. Good morning. Welcome to the first session of the day. We get to chit chat about mites because that will wake everyone up because we're all really excited about mites. Yes. So the reason we're all really excited about mites actually is probably the opposite of why I'm really excited about mites because I think they're kind of cool. The rest of us probably find them mildly annoying. Uh, so, or very annoying, depending upon your situation. So that video that played earlier is you could see this spider mite female actually sitting on that leaf. And what's really cool about their spots is those are actually digestive pigments. So if you get a nice scope like this, you can actually watch them pulse as they're pulling out uh, nutritive content from the leaf cells, uh, which we would rather they not do, obviously. So I'll be going through just kind of an overview of pest mite biology, some management reminders about different ways that we can manage them, uh, go through both pesticide non-target effects and some active ingredient efficacy overviews, talk a teeny bit about augmentation for those who are experimenting with purchasing and releasing natural enemies to control mites, uh, and throughout there'll be some recent research updates from my program sprinkled in. Uh, so first, who are our pests in pairs? And so people may think when they first look at this that, oh, you've forgotten to change your slide from an apple talk because you've got these two critters off to the right. Um, so I have those on there as a reminder that we're actually starting to see more and more of these in commercial pairs. In particular, I'm seeing more and more European red mite in commercial pairs. Uh, so I think that's something that we need to keep an eye out on, especially because I think pairs respond a little bit differently to two-spot feeding versus red mite feeding. They might, they're, I think they're a, little, they're a little bit less sensitive to red mite feeding. Uh, so it's something to keep an eye on in your orchard to see if those guys are kind of sprinkled in the mix. Uh, and then we can find some brown mites, both in apples and pears in organic situations. Uh, but of course, when we talk about mites and pears, we're mostly referring to these two, two-spotted spider mites and pear rust mite, both of which can be incredibly problematic. Uh, I also would be remiss if I didn't at least briefly mention pear blister mite. Uh, this tends to be more of a problem for folks that are organic. Um, this is one that I will say is incredibly difficult to control. People ask me for recommendations on blister mite, and I, it's, it's one that is very, very, very difficult. Uh, so typically whatever somebody is doing tends to be their best. Um, and this kind of shows why it's so hard to control blister mite. So these are the blisters on the leaf surface that you can look for, this dark reddish purple color. Um, and they are most of the time inside, and I've ripped that open with a, with a needle, and you can see the blister mite. So that makes it really hard for both natural enemies, like they can't feed on them, nothing goes inside those blisters, and it also obviously makes it hard for pesticides to reach. Th that one is incredibly tricky to control. I wanted to briefly do an overview on pesticide resistance, especially in the case of spider mites, and talk a little bit about why biologically they are so obnoxious when it comes to pesticide applications and resistance development. So first, a little bit of how spider mite sex determination works. Uh, so they do what you'd think is you've got a male and a female, and if they've got a fertilized egg from a mating event, all of those fertilized eggs produce daughters. So those who do apiculture will find this very familiar because it's very similar to the way that honeybees do it. Uh, however, a female can be completely unfertilized, has never seen a male in her whole life, and she can still have babies. All of her unfertilized eggs become sons. This becomes extra problematic in the case of pesticide resistance because uh, if you have a female that happens to be resistant to pesticides and she produces unfertilized eggs that are sons, uh, they're also resistant to pesticides. And if only that female and her sons are present on a leaf, they can actually mate with each other. And guess what? Those offspring are daughters who are also then pesticide resistant. So that is one of the many reasons mites develop resistance so quickly is because their ability to reproduce without having mated. Uh, so right now, I think I need to update this. I think we're at 98 now. There are 98 active ingredients for which resistance has been scientifically documented. So this is kind of an above and beyond stand standard for spider mites uh, with 500 plus individual documented cases. But the, the number of documented cases is, again, if only in the scientific literature. So it's, it's ridiculous. This is a very ridiculous organism for pesticide resistance. Um, here are the other reasons in which we see problems very regularly with spider mites. So they can lay over 100 eggs in 30 days. One generation takes about 10 days. That can go quicker when it's nice and hot outside. All of those generations overlap and co-occur, which means collectively when you've got a population that looks like this or like this, you have many opportunities for resistance development because every individual is an opportunity for resistance to develop. 
Uh, so this is older data now. In fact, it's over a decade old now. Uh, so I'm, I'd be interested in hearing about people's experiences. But this was a series of resistance screening assays. Uh, you don't need to worry necessarily about the numbers so much as these are individual populations which were collected from different orchards. And this dashed line represents the field rate, so the high label rate. You cannot spray more than this. And these little dots represent the amount of product needed to kill half of the population we tested, indicating that you would probably experience field failure uh, if you use these products. Uh, so we tended to find that, and, and then again, this is 10 years ago, that the adulticides had more problems uh, than the ovicides, but even so, we still had uh, one particular population that, that also had some, some serious issues with the ovicides. And I believe in this one, I think we had to fudge the numbers because we actually couldn't get the product to mix with water anymore. So we had to kind of make a guess as to what this, this number would be because we couldn't actually get it mathematically. Uh, it started falling out of solution and breaking our sprayer. So we quit, quit trying. Uh, so this is our poll question to make sure we're all alert uh, for this time of day, uh, especially for those on Zoom to show that they're attending. Uh, so those who are, are wanting to participate, uh, within the last two years, do you think a miticide you applied or recommended if you're a consultant in pairs had reduced efficacy due to pesticide resistance? Uh, for those who are not interested and in, in, who are in the room, can we just see like, a, like one of these or one of these? We're seeing a few people who are willing to to nod emphatically. So I'm going I'm to assume that this is a big problem for a lot of folks, especially those that have big conventional acreages, especially for some of these older products. Uh, so this is just really emphasizing that we have to be very careful with when we spray, what we spray, and how often we spray it, uh, because new miticides are scarce on the ground. Uh, so we have to be really careful with preserving what we have. Uh, in terms of what we can do to do that, that is not chemical control. So some folks have had luck with overhead irrigation in managing spider mite outbreaks, especially folks that are, that are doing it in the case of honeydew washing. Uh, so this can be somewhat helpful in knocking the mites back to the ground, kind of preventing them from getting so webby. Um, there are some indications that dust can cause problems with spider mites. It's a really mixed bag of evidence with people trying to like deliberately induce spider mites to prove that dust is the problem. I suspect it has something to do with how the dust interacts with the physiology of the tree as opposed to the dust itself, like blocking stomata or indicating that the area is very dry and therefore the tree is stressed out as opposed to the actual action of the dust itself, but uh, jury's out. Uh, mowing and herbicides can cause spider mite flare-ups, in particular if a spider mite uh, infestation is very well established in the ground cover, and then you come through and mow it or spray an herbicide, uh, that can cause them to make a choice about the only plant with green material left, which is up, and it's your tree. Uh, so that's another thing to be aware of, especially if you're seeing a lot of spider mites on the ground, is, is maybe relaxing weed management for a bit so that they don't have an incentive to go up. Uh, and then our thresholds in pair are currently half to two mites per leaf, kind of depending upon who you talk to and what variety you have. Uh, most folks like to manage it to more towards that, that 0 0.5 end, uh, just because pears are so sensitive to spider mite damage. Uh, so who are the predators you can be looking out for in a pear orchard? Uh, so the main one that most people are aware of are tiffs or western predatory mite, Galandromus occidentalis. We'll talk a little bit about that one. Um, we're seeing a lot more stethorus in orchards. In fact, I would say this year was a weird year for stethorus. I don't know if it's going to keep happening, um, but we saw them much earlier and much more abundantly than we typically do, where I saw them when I wasn't looking for them out of the corner of my eye, which for something so small is unusual. Uh, and then there are a lot of other things that will snack on mites, especially some of the younger stages of these uh, that are generalists. Uh, if mites are available, they will eat them. So I get this question a lot, is where can I find a good collection of non-target effects information for these predators? Um, so there's a few places you can go. There are two companies that have apps that you can download. Both Copert and BioBest have apps with also websites associated with them. Uh, the caution with these is most of the natural enemies they have on there are not our, our orchard natural enemies. So what you have to do is kind of e either hope that what you're looking for is in there. If not, you have to find the next closest living relative. So if you're looking for phytoceids, they don't have western predatory mite on there. You're going to have to pick some of the other predator mites and kind of average out uh, non-target effects uh, since they're mostly targeted to the greenhouse industry, what they're selling. Uh, IOBC does have a side effects database, uh, so you can join, uh, become basically become an IOBC member and pay an annual fee to get access to that database. Uh, the DAS has non-target information that's obviously more specific to orchards, 
um, as does the opened website, although this one is one we, we are very much aware we do need to update with a lot of the newer active ingredients. Uh, so some new research we have on non-target effects of pesticides on stethorists, uh, in part, which was inspired by how abundant they were this year. Um, so what we're seeing is that in general, because this is an adult lady beetle that we're testing, even though it is a very small one, uh, they tend to be fairly pesticide tolerant compared to some other things that we've looked at. Uh, I've highlighted here in red the ones that were the most problematic. Um, not a whole lot of surprises here, so we're seeing the more broad spectrum miticides that also kill insects, Savanto. Um, most of the copper hydroxide products are gonna be pretty hard on most natural enemies. So again, no surprises there for me. This was really the only one that maybe go, huh, that's, that is interesting. Uh, so we saw Exeril, which is one of our selective diamides, uh, being basically as toxic to them as, as those neonics. Um, that is actually true for a lot of lady beetles after we started kind of looking around. So in the cases where you think you might be wanting to preserve lady beetles, but in particular stethorus, Alticor might be a better choice than Exeril if you're, if you're going in for coddling moth management. Uh, another thing that we did is to compare those results with stethorus with our other main mite predator. So here's the Western predatory mite results. Um, if somebody actually really wants just this table, I'm, I'm happy to share this as a PDF so you're not frantically jotting down numbers. Uh, what I wanted to highlight is the instances where things get bad for specific products and then kind of looking any any product that's got a red highlight is hard on one or both of these natural enemies. Uh, and in, again, in general, it tends to be those broad spectrum miticides. And then the other thing to note is because we tested adult stethorus, uh, the rhymen appears to not be harmful to them. I, I don't know what would happen if we had sprayed it on a juvenile, since that is an, an insect growth regulator, we might have seen some more substantial non-target effects. Uh, but in general, the ones I have here in red are the ones to kind of be cautious about, especially if you know you have these natural enemies in your orchard. I wanted to briefly go over what's available for spider mite and rust mite control. And kind of, I, I think I have this all updated, but if someone knows better on a label, has looked at it more recently, there's been a change, uh, take the label's word over mine, please. Uh, so what we've got is basically a series of products that only allow one or two applications. So again, caution about when you use them. Um, a reminder that the different products have different um, modes of action, which means they act on different stages. So in general, you're gonna find a lot of the products only target modals, uh, so those are the adults and moving around juveniles, but you do get some egg activity with these two products. Um, and then in general, uh, the one that's really gonna suppress oviposition is zeal, but again, also suppresses oviposition of your predator mites too. Um, we again, rust mites, like their cousins, the blister mites, there, there are a lot of challenges here. Um, so one is the lack of efficacy trial work um, that more recently with some of the newer products, but the other one is just that there are not a lot of products that are registered on, on must rust mites. So these are all um, coming from the handbook, the WSU handbook, with Vindex being known to be pretty effective. I think I've heard from some folks saying that they've had good luck with Fujimite and Agrimec, but it kind of, again, depends upon how often they've been spraying those products as to whether or not they've worn them out. So yeah, th these mites are always gonna be a big challenge for us. And then lastly, I wanted to highlight in green the products that are generally pretty soft on natural enemies across the board. Um, again, this, they're not going to be soft on every single natural enemy that ever exists in a pear orchard. This is kind of a rough average of things that are important for mite management uh, and generally being soft. So I get this question a lot, especially from folks that are organic or hoping to transition to organic, is while I'm going through that rough patch, is there something I can buy to control pest mites? Um, right now, what's on the insectary market that would actually be even remotely viable in terms of this thing will definitely eat mites are these three categories. So you can purchase a variety of species of predator mites. Uh, you can purchase stethorus. I'll talk about that in a second. And then you can also purchase aureus insidiosus. So for the predator mites, there, there are dozens of species on the market. Um, so that, that makes it a little tricky to decide. I would definitely lean more into buying our native Western predatory mite as opposed to buying these other species, but the other species are much cheaper. So if someone actually feels like they're having good success with the other species, by all means, go for it. 
Stetheris can be tricky because of availability issues. Right now there is only one company in all of North America that produces Stetheris. Uh, we have a lot of acreage out here, so if we want to treat all of our acreage, they immediately run out of it uh, almost instantaneously every year. Uh, so that, that can be a hard one to get. They're also a little pricey, um, but I know our folks uh, that grow hops tend to feel like they've got good success with mite control and Stetheris. And then Aureus will eat spider mites, but I, have, I haven't seen anything in the literature testing its ability to control spider mites and treat fruit, so I have no idea whether or not it works. Um, so again, I trust, that's, I trust those western predatory mites are our tips the most, but they're expensive and difficult to source. Uh, some people that start out start with Phytocelus persimilis because it is the cheapest of the batch. Uh, I don't think it likes our, our hot, hot, dry, dry summers. Uh, so that one I would, I would not really recommend. People have a lot of problems finding it again after they release it. Uh, I wanted to briefly mention whirligigs. So this is my have you seen this mite sort of, of pitch wanted poster. Uh, so we kind of became aware of this mite uh, last year as a potential major source of biocontrol in a very unrelated project surveying habitat near potatoes and found that it was incredibly common in those habitats. And then one of our colleagues, Bonnie Oler, discovered that when she tested them for DNA of pests, uh, that a, a lot of them had eaten pests that were near the potato fields, in this case, flower thrips and potato psyllid. Uh, so we were like, well, if they eat potato psyllids, I, I think they might eat pear psylla. So we started kind of digging into our data, and we found that they're actually quite common in the pear orchards that we've been surveying. Um, this was not an organic orchard, so they can, they can do well in uh, conventional orchards too. Uh, we kind of found some association with spider mites and rust mites in terms of when these populations peaked, but there's also some association with parasilla, uh, so kind of a good indicator that they're feeding on all of these things. Um, they are a really interesting critter in that they've got a pretty long life cycle. They do two generations per year. There are no males. Uh, they reproduce entirely as females. All of them are girls. Uh, they are amazingly fast, so that 30 meters per second translates into twice as fast as a cheetah, if you count for body length. And they are voracious, voracious little killing machines. Uh, the other cool thing about them is they seem to be relatively pesticide tolerant, based on some work coming out of Quebec, uh, with them not really being that impacted by the Neonex, although you know some of our really harsh products, like the, the Carboril and the Warrior, are still harmful. They are available for purchase, but only currently in Canada and Oregon. They're kind of hoping to expand into Washington, but that is, is not true as of yet. Uh, so this is something that it is possible for folks to try. Uh, for Parasilla and mite control, they are pricey, so I would not recommend doing it too often. Uh, but the thing that's most impressive about them is what won't they eat? Uh, lots of tree fruit pests on that list of them documenting eating them. Uh, we have some nice uh, photos from Bonnie showing that they will eat pretty much every pest that we stick in front of them. And uh, some previous work showing in particular for the spider mites uh, that they can eat quite a few of them in a day, especially if you look at the fact that these are, these are females that they're consuming, not even the smaller stages. Uh, so we're hoping to dig more into this, but just be aware that if you see a very uh, large-ish for a mite, red, fast-moving thing in your orchards. It is not European red mite, it is, it is this guy and it is beneficial. Uh, I wanted to end with some updates from our mite survey work that we've been doing in pear. So what we've been looking at is three different growing, pear growing regions, uh, so Hood River, Wenatchee Valley, and Yakima. And just looking at some trends here, uh, we can see that kind of as you'd suspect, Wenatchee has more problems with spider mites than the other two regions, likely because of the non-target effects of the psyllid sprays. Uh, but I was surprised to find that Yakima differed so much from the other two regions in terms of having some, some rust mite pro problems. Uh, in general, what we found, and I've got the pear psylla natural enemies on here too, uh, is that the regions did differ pretty strongly um, in terms of what natural enemies were most common on sticky cards, what made up the relative most of what we were finding with fewer Stetheris uh, and Wenatchee, but more Dariocaris, and that kind of slowly shifting as you move south into Hood River. Uh, shocking nobody, I guess, the Paracilla specialist uh, becomes less and less common uh, as you move to areas that have fewer and fewer Paracilla. 
Uh, in terms of just kind of a snapshot from Yakima from this year in a beat tray sample, so the last set was sticky cards. This captures some things that you don't get on sticky cards. Uh, we found both spiders, Dariocaris, and Stetheris to be incredibly common along with Campoloma. So we do have a lot of potential spider mite natural enemies wandering around in our pear orchards that could potentially be exploited for biocontrol. Um, one of the cool things about Stetheris this last year is we tend to think of it as something that shows up really late. And we were finding it basically as soon as it was warm enough for us to think about warming around in the orchard. Again, I don't know what it was about 2023 that made, Stether like made it a Stetheris year, but it seemed to be one. Uh, and it was showing up before both two, before two spots became a problem. I don't know if it was feeding on the pear rust mites or if it was feeding on some unrelated mites in the weeds. Uh, so we'll see what, what 2024 brings, uh, but I think Stethorus could become increasingly important. I wanted to briefly mention that we've had some luck using this commercial product Predalure in recruiting Stethorus to spots in an orchard. Uh, they are attracted to Predalure um, and we were using it at a rate of about a, uh, one lure per quarter acre. Uh, in terms of western predatory mite, in pears it just doesn't seem to be around as early as it is in apples and doesn't really seem to show up unless the spider mites become a big problem, which is maybe why we see, in addition to pears being more sensitive, so many problems with pear bio or biocontrol with, with pears and spider mites. It's just the western predatory mites aren't hanging around until you've already got a big issue. And lastly, I wanted to mention some of the weed associations. So we were looking at whether or not we were finding lots of spider mites and predatory mites in the weeds. We sure did. Uh, they tended to be more prevalent in orchards that had serious spider mite problems. If there was a problem in the tree, there tended to be a problem in the weeds too. Uh, with a loose, not super tight, but loose association uh, with orchards that had more bindweed and clover. So this is one spot to keep an eye on is kind of be scouting your bindweed and clover if you have a lot of it. See if you've got two spots there uh, and kind of consider either making sure it's very clean early in the season so you don't get two spot buildup and definitely not overly controlling it if there's a lot of two spots on there already because they're just going to move into the tree after the, after the weeds are controlled. Uh, so our next steps with that project is figuring out who ate the mites, and we'll also do Paracilla too with some gut content work to kind of figure out which of our predators are doing the most heavy lifting for spider mite and rust mite control in orchards. And with that, I'd like to say thanks to all the folks that have collected a lot of data over the years, uh, plus the folks that specifically helped with, with funding and data collection uh, for collaborating on these projects.